Dallas is doing something new and I like it. In fact, it's kind of brilliant. Back in 2020, when Dallas hired head coach Mike McCarthy, many of us were thinking that maybe he was going to install the West Coast offense that he and Joe Philbin ran in Green Bay during the early 2010s. But Jerry Jones and Mike McCarthy decided to stick with offensive coordinator Kellen Moore's Air Corio's offense. Drafting's not our problem. Coaching is. <laughs> <laughs> McCarthy did implement some of his aspects of his offense into Moore's system system over the years, but for the most part, it was all Moore's concepts. When Kellen Moore was fired and Schottenheimer, another disciple of the Coriol offense, became the offensive coordinator, both Schottenheimer and McCarthy decided to implement both philosophies, the Air Coriol and the West Coast offense. These are two conflicting concepts that also share sub two similarities. In this video, I will examine the nature and correlation of each offensive concept and develop an idea of how I think they can create the best offense in football in this upcoming season. I want to give a shout out to my subscriber One Hand Bandit for requesting this video. If you guys have a video request of your own, let me know about it. Maybe I can make a video for you. McCarthy's roots in the West Coast offense goes deep. As an undergraduate at Pittsburgh University, McCarthy studied the West Coast offense under Paul Hackett in the late 80s. It should be noted that Hackett learned under Bill Walsh in San Francisco in the mid 80s. McCarthy spent his time reviewing the University of Pittsburgh playbook during his part-time job at a tool booth. Hackett left Pittsburgh with McCarthy and took an offensive coordinated position in Kansas City working under Marty Schottenheimer. Schottenheimer had the legendary Joe Montana on his roster along with the promising young coordinator in the making, Brian Schottenheimer. McCarthy has remained true to Wash's core philosophy with tweaks that set him apart. For example, McCarthy is a master of the play-action offense. Having received his fundamentals from Marty Schottenheimer, although he doesn't use a play action as often as Brian Schottenheimer does, McCarthy executes the play action with lethal, unstoppable short timing routes. For instance, the Packers would frequently run the ball, followed by an effective Aaron Rodgers play action, causing the linebackers to pause briefly before he hits his target for a short gain of three to four yards. Fast timing routes that struck defenders before they could even make a play on the ball was a killer that Rodgers used to dice up the league for years with. First throw, short throw. Quick. Third down and 10, blitz coming, quick throw, completion, Jones, first down. This kind of precise football minimizes turnovers. In fact, McCarthy's quarterbacks in Kansas City only had 52 interceptions from 1995 to 1998, which happened to be the lowest totals of that time in the league. McCarthy intends to expand the field, just as Brian Schottenheimer does. He aims to compel the defense to become aggressive on short and intermediate passes, thereby adhering to the principles of the West Coast while giving Schottenheimer's Air Coriel's offense the chance to annihilate the DBs on the back end. This is perfect harmony, and if successful, will usher in the most exquisite football seen in decades. This type of football takes away limitations. It attacks vertical using Air Coriel's principles. If you try and take the verticals away, it attacks horizontally keeping true to the West Coast offense. And if you try to take that away, it's made to methodically slice you open like a surgeon with killer routes underneath. This offense runs the ball. It's a master in the play action offense and a master in timing routes, which means setting up and finding mismatch coverages throughout the defensive backfield. Correlating two of the most productive offensive concepts in football history is going to make Dallas a formidable offense that teams will not be able to limit or put in the box. But there's more to this. I understand there are questions regarding Dak Prescott's suitability for this system, specifically his accuracy, deep ball game, ability to read defenses, and tendency to commit turnovers. Noting his 17 interceptions last season with playoffs included. In the next couple of minutes, I will do my best to address these concerns and go into more depth. The West Coast principles and concepts were created during Wash's days in Cincinnati when promising quarterback Greg Cook was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in 1969. Cook won the Rookie of the Year award and was considered to be one of the most talented players in league history. And Cook, one of the few rookie quarterbacks that I've ever seen that can go to a second or a third receiver. But just in his sophomore season, he was injured on a sack and ultimately had to retire. NFL Films named him one of the biggest what-ifs in NFL history. That's how talented he was. Wash said, and I quote, Greg is the greatest talent to ever play the position. That's saying something. Wash coached arguably the greatest quarterback in history, Joe Montana, and arguably the most athletic quarterback in history, Steve Young. For him to say that, 
It had to mean something, and it had to be a devastating loss. After losing Greer Cook, Bill Walsh, and another offensive of genius, Paul Brown devised an offense that would shake up the league for the next two decades and beyond. But the pressure to implement this concept would fall on the arm of an untalented genius. Unlike Cook, Virgil Carter did not have arm talent. He had no zip on the ball, and he couldn't throw the deep pass well. But what he did have was intelligence and accuracy. He taught statistics and mathematics at Xavier University and was one of the forefathers in creating a matrix known as expected points. So yeah, he was intelligent. Instead of focusing on the gunslinger concept like the vertical pass, Walsh decided to use Virgil's lack of arm strength to carve up defenses on short to intermediate passes horizontally. This philosophy increased completion percentages from 1969 to 1972 by almost 5%. Walsh created a high percentage passing game that allowed receivers to dominate in yards after catch. By the time Walsh arrived in San Francisco, he had developed a system that didn't depend on talents like arm strength strength or elite speed, but on wits, fundamentals, and accuracy. It was poetry in motion. Every intricate part of the offense had purpose, from the steps of the quarterback, the motion of the offensive line, to the detailed route of the wide receiver. Walsh was so detailed that he even timed how long the ball traveled in the air. The passing game developed into a moderate run game. Instead of running the ball on second and third down, Walsh wanted to control time of possession. He wanted to play at his own pace, lure you to sleep, and then take his shot. He used routes like carols, hitches, and slants to stretch the field. He didn't need talented players. He wanted intelligent players who could get from point A to point B precisely in time. Receivers needed to learn how to read zone concepts and be intelligent enough to know where the defense's windows was and who the hot man was. This may sound similar to Corio's offense, but it actually isn't. Corio ran the ball in order to do what he wanted to do, and that was to use the play action to go vertical. It was always about the vertical pass. Make no mistake about it. If Coriel could throw 40-yard bombs every play and get away with it, the guy would. Aggressive, aggressive, aggressive was Coriel's name of the game. While moderation and control were Wash's concept. Walsh wanted to keep the ball within 15 to 20 yards of deep passes because he thought the ball's airtime was more efficient and faster than a 40-yard bomb. This is actually a great idea, especially when you have one of the best deep passes of the ball, Dak Prescott, on your team. The misconception around Cowboy circles is that Dak can't throw an accurate ball past 15 yards. This just isn't true. In 2021, when he had a full healthy season, PFF gave him a 94.5 deep passing grade. He completed 32 of his 73 passing attempts. Dallas didn't throw deep 40-yard bombs like Coriel's offenses of the past. Even North Turner had Aikman throw some really long passes to Irvin in the 90s. Doc's passes were right in line where Walsh wanted the ball to travel about 20 yards down the field. According to PFF, he did it better than Joe Barrow, Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, and Josh Allen. That's five of the top deep passes in the NFL. On passes 15 to 20 yards out, he had 104 passer rate. This is perfect for both concepts because not only can Dak be aggressive and throw the ball deep like you would want in a Don Coriol offense, but he can also throw accurately within the 15 to 20 yard range down the field like a West Coast quarterback. Coriel didn't care about incompletions, but Walsh dreaded them because they stopped the clock and took away from the poetry of his offense. Since 2016, Dak Prescott has only been in the top 10 in completion percentages twice. But is that all on Dak? I know it's easy to say that Doc is an inaccurate passer, but sometimes what we see on the field from home, watching the game on TV, or in the stands is not always an accurate view of what happened on the field. Can I prove this? So I went looking at stats that give us a story on why a quarterback's completion percentages diminish throughout the season. Stats like drops, bad throws, batted passes are daily to a quarterback's accuracy percentages. In just 12 games, Doc had 23 drops, giving him a 6.2 percent drop rate. If we imagine those drops didn't occur, Doc's completion percentages could have easily been higher. That's great, right? But then I looked at this stat. He threw 67 bad passes in 2022 and over 86 bad passes in 2021. This confirms that Doc is inaccurate, right? Well, 
it's how you see it. I went and looked at Aaron Rodgers' numbers. You know, one of the most accurate quarterbacks in history. In 2021, he had 93 bad passes. This past season, he had 76 bad passes. That's more bad passes than Dak had in his two seasons. In fact, I'll go even further. Rodgers had 394 on target passes in 2021 and 415 on target passes last season. Dak had 452 on target passes in 2021 and 296 on target passes in 2022, even though he missed five games. I'm starting to think we need to change our perception of Dak in terms of his accuracy. I will say this to be fair. Dak did throw more passes than Rodgers did in 2021. This definitely increased his on-target numbers. Doc had a 77% on on-target rate, while Aaron Rodgers had an 80% on on-target rates, which is not that far off. Doc's numbers are actually in the ballpark of one of the most accurate quarterbacks in history. The three step back from under center has become as iconic as the shotgun spread itself. No one did it better than Montana. Montana's going to throw rhythm passes, at least early in this ballgame, getting rid of the ball in a hurry. Right inside the 15, the 10, touchdown. Wash's theory was that if he had his quarterback shorten their drop back rate, the quick throws would produce less sacks and better efficiency in the passing game. This West Coast concept will be perfect for Dak Prescott. Prescott ranked 20th in time to throw. His time to throw numbers were 2.5. Where you want to be is at around 2.5. Dallas held onto the ball for far too long, and that was because of Callum Moore's long vertical routes. This also contributed to his interceptions, as the defense was already anticipating the pass by the time Doc threw the ball. Some of that responsibility falls on Doc for not reading through his progressions fast enough, but the majority of the blame lies with the Don Corio scheme that Callum Moore implemented. Doc threw 17 interceptions last season, but what's interesting is that when he threw the ball in 2.5 seconds or less, he completed 77% of his passes, threw for eight touchdowns, had three interceptions, and registered a passer rating of 99.3. On the contrary, when Doc held the ball for more than 2.5 seconds, his completion percentage dropped by 20% to 57.8. He had 14 interceptions to 20 touchdowns, resulting in a touchdown to interception ratio straight out of a horror movie. Even his passer rating dropped 10 points to 87.5. The West Coast offense is going to help Doc tremendously as getting the ball out of his hands will minimize interceptions and create more efficient and effective offense. Thanks to Schottenheimer, McCarthy will use play action more than he ever has before, but McCarthy's West Coast concept will force Schottenheimer to design play action passes that are centered around timing routes, not just deep passes that we see in Corio's offenses. In Walsh's offense, the quarterback will go through what's called progression. A progression through three reads is oftentimes the case, and if there's no one open, the quarterback checks back down to either the tight end or the running back. If I look at everything that we've talked about so far, this is probably Doc's weakest area. Sometimes Doc can get flustered if things aren't developing the right way. He doesn't take the time to read through all of his progressions, and then he holds the ball for far too long. But again, this stems from the long routes of Callum Moore. Quick timing routes forces you to go through your progressions. Doc won't have time to stare down a receiver because the receiver's route will already be finished by the time he progresses onto the next player. Everything in the West Coast offense is about timing, rhythm, and balance. No wonder why Aaron Rodgers said that the West Coast offense is the most beautiful offense ever created. It's plays like this that will put Doc in the position to succeed in the upcoming season. Corey, you required talented players, quarterbacks with amazing arm talent, to push the ball past defensive coverages and the fast as wide receivers on the field who could outrun almost any defensive package. Walsh, on the other hand, prioritized efficiency and effectiveness, focusing on methodically moving down the field and dominating in yards after catch. If the defense comes up in coverage, they'll take their chances. To me, this is where both concepts balance out, as there are root problems to both. Being too aggressive can cause turnovers and incompletions, which can make your offense less efficient and effective. On the contrary, being too patient can stall your offense and turn it into a repetitive machine. However, if we combine these two concepts, we can achieve the perfect blend of aggression and patience. The perfect storm. I view both legendary coaches like this. Wash was a marathon runner who elegantly made his way into the end zone, while Coriel was a skyrocket who explosively made 
made his way into the end zone. I don't want you guys to misunderstand me. Both coaches' ultimate goal was to create big plays. The difference is, Coriel wanted to do it vertically off the run, and Walsh wanted to do it horizontally off short intermediate passes. Now that we know these two conflicting concepts can philosophically coincide with each other, has anyone ever achieved this on the field? The answer is yes. Meet Sid Gilman. However, I doubt that anything was more important than the establishment of the American Football League. I admit that I didn't know much about Sid Gilman until I did my research. I know this is about to sound like a contradiction. The philosophy of both the West Coast offense and the Coriel offense originates from one man, Sid Gilman. Gilman was a mastermind who created much of what you see on Sundays. Ironically, Gilman did not have a run first and throw philosophy like Coriel had. His offensive principles mirrored more of Bill Walsh's past to set up the run philosophy. However, unlike Walsh and much like Coriel, Gilman loved to attack vertically down the field. Gilman is the perfect example of how the Coriol offense and the West Coast offense can complement each other perfectly. Dallas is some of the best coaches in the league when it comes to installing both legendary concepts. Until next time, make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.